Good morning to everyone. Welcome to the conference. Uh, my duty is to moderate to introduce our speaker. Uh, I will start immediately for because we have a very short time. Uh, and uh, I have it in to introduce uh, uh, the woman uh, for whose merit of uh, fault depends on the point of view. We are all here. Uh, uh, this morning and in these three days uh, with uh, Gilda Farrell, uh, who is uh, the head of the unit uh, at, on the social cohesion uh, and research and early warning uh, division of the Council of Europe, but uh, mainly is the person who invented the, the project uh, which is ended uh, today and uh, led it uh, for three years. Uh, I discovered uh, in, 80, in 80 years, uh, which uh, I am working with Gilda, that Gilda is uh, the best trainer for uh, lazy researchers. And uh, I think that in these uh, two, three days uh, of conference, uh, you will appreciate that. Then Gilda, this is your time. Thank you very much. <coughs> I didn't know that I, I am the the best trainer for lazy researchers, but still I can accept the role. And I, I, I will speak in French anyhow. Mesdames, uh, Messieurs, et chers amis, vous avez uh, uh, répondu nombreux à notre invitation. Vous savez, vous venez de 55 pays et plus d'une centaine d'organisations sont présentes ici. Cette conférence, uh, Pauvreté et inégalité dans des sociétés des droits humains, un paradoxe de la démocratie, a lieu, comme vous l'avez entendu du commissaire et de notre secrétaire général, dans un contexte où les instruments conventionnels de lutte contre la pauvreté s'avèrent insuffisants à faire face à un phénomène de nature différente à celui que l'Europe a connu les siècles derniers, lorsque la pauvreté pouvait être combattu par la croissance économique et du marché du travail, ainsi que pour l'expansion de la protection universelle. Aujourd'hui, on assiste à l'appauvrissement et à la précarisation d'un nombre croissant de personnes et de familles, tandis que la concentration de la richesse et du patrimoine, comme le secrétaire général l'a dit, touche à des niveaux qui font aussi que les concepts même de cohésion sociale, si chers au Conseil de l'Europe, risquent de perdre son sens. Cette conférence qui s'inscrit dans le cadre de la coopération que nous avons avec la Commission européenne, et je remercie Emma et le commissaire euh, pour cette opportunité, adresse des questions substantielles d'une transformation sociale qui conduit à ce que la distance entre les extrêmes de la distribution économique se creuse jusqu'à faire émerger des paradoxes. Il nous invite à réfléchir sur l'essence même de vivre ensemble en dignité, appuyé sur un socle de valeurs fondamentales sur lesquelles sur laquelle l'Europe s'est construit. Notre Europe, vous le savez, s'est construit sur un concept d'universalité et d'indivisibilité des droits, ainsi que d'intégrité dans leur contenu. Face à la crise actuelle, l'idée que la régression des droits sociaux est possible, et avec ceux des droits civils et politiques, parce que vous savez que les uns ne peuvent pas s'exercer avec les autres, cette idée fait son chemin, montrant peut-être que c'est notre avenir. Et donc, on affirme une tendance à substituer les principes de l'universalité par un ciblage plus affiné des populations qui desserviraient l'aide publique. Ciblage, vous le savez tous, qui peut tourner parfois à la stigmatisation des personnes. Répondre à l'appauvrissement est bien plus complexe en ce moment. Vous avez entendu les statistiques et on devrait devoir cibler peut-être 50% de certains groupes de populations 
comme la jeunesse de l'Espagne, de la Bulgarie, de la Grèce. Comment pouvons-nous envisager une sortie à cette situation s'il n'y a pas de discussion entre nous sur la location universelle, les salaires minimums garantis ou d'autres mesures que nous pouvons imaginer ensemble pour éviter les stigmatisations et activer le potentiel créatif de chacun de nous. Dans une Europe des droits, aujourd'hui, il y a des enfants qui travaillent pour des salaires de misère. Il y a même des enfants qui arrivent à l'école sans manger. Comment pouvons-nous accepter de telles réalités sans identifier les responsabilités et en assumer notre Europe s'est bâtie aussi sur les principes de la démocratie. Comment pouvons-nous structurer aujourd'hui une politique démocratique dans un contexte de croissante inégalité L'essence même de la démocratie est la médiation entre intérêts et expression et besoins divers. La médiation, comment-elle pour apporter ses fruits et s'exercer lorsque l'inégalité fait en sort que uniquement certains intérêts puissent, être appara puissent apparaître dignes de considération. Il y a des efforts de la société civile pour articuler la voie de ce qui subissent les conséquences de la pauvreté. Parfois, ces efforts sont anéantis par des inerties administratives, comme on l'a appris lors de ces projets des différents témoignages. C'est-à-dire que les personnes les plus vulnérables doivent parfois faire la file devant nos administrations pour remplir des formulaires et ne pas obtenir des réponses qui peut être dans le long terme. Notre Europe s'appuie aussi sur les concepts de responsabilité. Notre stratégie de cohésion sociale invite à partager la responsabilité sociale. Responsabilité qui, dans notre stratégie de cohésion sociale, veut dire protéger les plus faibles, notamment de la part de ceux qui détiennent différentes formes de pouvoir. Une telle responsabilité est tout d'abord l'expression d'une fiscalité progressive, mais aussi de la priorité dans les, investi dans les investissements publics. On l'a pris aussi au long de ces projets que les couches plus aisées de la population sont taxées souvent au même niveau que les plus pauvres et que des investissements dans les quartiers plus aisés sont plus élevés que dans, la, dans les quartiers plus pauvres. Par ailleurs, comment allons-nous adresser la question de la responsabilité sur les gaspillages, comme a été dit par notre secrétaire général, gaspillage des ressources humaines et d'autres indispensables pour assurer la vie en dignité pour tous. Nous avons une jeunesse qualifiée comme jamais, mais dont un pourcentage croissant vit dans les seuils de pauvreté et ne peut pas envisager un avenir. Plus encore, comment nous allons justifier le gaspillage des produits alimentaires à des niveaux tellement alarmants qui a été, ceci a été dénoncé par le Parlement européen. Cette conférence, néanmoins, qui a été préparée avec la participation de nombreuses personnes et associations auxquelles je remercie de cœur, n'était pas conçue pour se confiner au constat, par ailleurs souvent bien plus facile à faire, que d'envisager les chemins de la transformation, pourtant à retrouver, maintenant à retrouver, l'essence de la justice sociale. Nous souhaitons donc que cette conférence préparée avec vous puisse avancer avec des propositions pour une société inclusive à soutien de la politique qui a été, et des désirs qui a été exprimés ce matin par le commissaire Andor et par, par notre secrétaire général. Vous allez trouver des propositions dans les guides vivre en dignité dans le XXIe siècle qui vous a été distribué dans sa version provisoire. Vous allez, en deux mois, on allait, à, allait y avoir la version définitive. Mais moi, je voudrais, pour conclure, attirer l'attention sur les principes que notre groupe de travail a définis comme étant indispensables à guider l'action de lutte contre la pauvreté dans le XXIe siècle. 
il y en a eu six principes définis. Le premier, toute politique de lutte contre la pauvreté aujourd'hui doit contribuer à progresser vers la justice sociale par la réduction de la distance dans l'accès au même contenu des droits et des bien-être, et ceci dans le respect du principe de l'universalité. Deux, toute politique de lutte contre la pauvreté doit s'assurer d'une efficacité qui évite la stigmatisation ou la catégorisation des personnes. Trois, toute politique de lutte contre la pauvreté doit ouvrir, ouvrir des voies d'apprentissage pour bâtir des biens communs par le partage des ressources, par la gestion participative et par l'activation du potentiel et de, de l'imaginaire des citoyens. Quatre, doit éviter toute forme de gaspillage. Cinq, être non seulement inclusive dans sa conception, mais active dans l'identification de ces qui pourraient être inclus et qui ne le sont pas à cause de multiples barrières et formes de marginalisation. Six, s'assurer que la dignité humaine en tant que droit pour tous se renforce dans la conscience publique en tenant compte de la multiplicité d'aspects qui contribuent, par exemple, un bon transport public, un service coordonné des administrations, des espaces publics verts accessibles pour tous. Je voudrais finalement vous inviter à utiliser cette opportunité unique qui nous a été donnée aujourd'hui, grâce à notre coopération et à l'appui de l'Union européenne, pour réfléchir à un avenir de bien-être et de dignité humaine en Europe. La façon dont l'information sur la crise des véhicules aujourd'hui nous laisse entendre que nous n'avons pas d'avenir dans le bien-être et dans la dignité pour tous. Que nous sommes avoués à la fragmentation sociale, je crois que ceci est fondamentalement faux. Comment un continent si riche de savoir, de capacités innovatrices, si riche de solidarité, peut être privé d'un avenir de justice sociale. J'espère que vous partagez avec moi cet espoir que nous avons un avenir dans la justice sociale. Je pense qu'il faut, comme le, le secrétaire général a dit, travailler dans ce sens. Nous avons découvert au long de ces projets, et je l'ai découvert grâce à vous, qu'on a une voie, et cette voie, c'est déstigmatiser la politique de lutte contre la pauvreté. Déstigmatiser signifie que nous sommes capables d'activer des ressources, y compris de ceux qui on pense qu'ils n'ont rien à contribuer. Déstigmatiser, ça veut dire que nous cherchons des voies horizontales d'intégration, que nous donnons à chacun sa place dans un projet commun. Déstigmatiser la politique de lutte contre la pauvreté, c'est notre message aujourd'hui et je pense que c'est le message pour retrouver, nous tous, un chemin d'avenir en Europe, un chemin de dignité pour toutes les personnes. Nous allons, et je termine avec ça, développer cette année aussi, en coopération avec la Commission européenne, un projet expérimental dans les villes de l'Europe pour mobiliser et inciter les citoyens en coopération avec les autorités locales, à identifier les ressources gaspillées, les ressources abandonnées, les ressources qui pourront être mobilisées pour lutter contre la pauvreté et l'appauvrissement. Et ceci, à cette réflexion, nous allons dédier avec certains de vous la journée de samedi. Il ne me reste que vous souhaiter de tout cœur, vraiment, de profiter de ces moments d'échange et de réflexion pour puiser dans l'écoute, dans les contacts que vous pouvez nouer entre vous et dans les idées qui pouvaient émerger, la force pour forger un avenir sans pauvreté. Merci beaucoup.
Now I give the floor to Emma Toledano Laredo, who is the head of the unit Social Inclusion and Poverty Reduction of the European Commission. The unit is pursuing its uh, institutional aims uh, without, within the framework of the European uh, Strategy 2020, according to which uh, I mean, they, you are looking for a smart, a sustainable uh, and an inclusive uh, growth in the next decade. Uh, in, in the guide that, that uh, you got uh, when uh, entered and uh, to which uh, Gilda was uh, referring, uh, we put forward that one main point in this strategy are commons, the creation of uh, the end commun. Then uh, would like to know your opinion and which is according to the European Union, uh, in the core of this strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Santoro. Um, thank you, Gilda. It's always a challenge to speak uh, after Gilda for the for her experience, for the strength that she puts in her words, and for the heart uh, and time that she, that she uh, gives and devotes to, uh, to this very challenging work that, uh, that it is in front of all of us. I am extremely honored to be here today in the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly and uh, to be with you. Um, I've been on this job for a bit more than one year and I'm uh, in front of people and organizations that, that are extremely competent, extremely committed, and firmly determined um, to fight poverty and social exclusion. For its role, uh, and I will certainly not be uh, exhaustive, and you've heard already uh, a lot of information for, from my commissioner, uh, for its role, the commission, as you know, and you've mentioned it uh, also, Mr. Santoro, we have a strategy that was uh, adopted in 2010 for which the EU member states at the time committed themselves to uh, lift 20 million Europeans from poverty uh, in 2020, in 2020. And as you have heard the Secretary General of the Council of Europe and my Commissioner uh, indicate, uh, all the statistics go exactly in the opposite direction. And this, is, this puts us in front of a very, very difficult work to indeed go uh, for an in inclusive growth, as the strategy says, for a more cohesive and equal society um, and, and ensure the stability uh, of, of our European democracies. Well, what do we do uh, with the strategy? Well, we need strong analysis. We need to know to monitor the situation in the member states, so with a national perspective, and we need to have a European perspective. We need to understand the root causes of poverty and social exclusion, poverty being a multidimensional phenomenon and, and an evolutionary phenomenon. Uh, we need to identify efficient policies at the national level and see whether they can be replicated at the European level to give uh, relevant guidance to, to the member states for this. And it's not an easy task because obviously national policies and protection systems are based on a cultural and historical national heritage. And, but we know, as my commissioner has said, that not all social protection systems at the national level are equally effective with the comparative level of social expenditure. So we know that there is scope for studying this and for improving and for giving uh, relevant guidance to, to member states. We also do test innovative and experimental social policies. Uh, we've heard uh, Mr. Ando say that this is the time for innovative approaches. Gilda has very rightly said that this is, uh, we can, our instrument, our classical instruments to fight poverty no longer uh, respond to the challenge. So that's also an investment that the European Commission is doing. And we constantly review our analysis. As I was saying, uh, the poverty is a multidimensional uh, phenomenon and it is very much in constant evolution. What we see today is the younger generation paying uh, most of the price of the crisis, we see new phenomena uh, like in-work poverty, where, whereby it is no longer sufficient to have a job 
to, to avoid being at risk of poverty. Single parent families are extremely facing the dire situations and demographic trends also call for a constant reviewing and adaptation of our welfare models to reply to these evolving societal challenges. So what do we do when with our analysis and, and all the, the studies and all the information that we gather from different sources also with very much with your help. We have this process, the European semester that my commissioner has mentioned, where through which we monitor the situation of member states uh, uh, for, the t for the targets of the EU 2020 strategy and the process which is on an annual basis ultimately um, comes with what we call country-specific recommendations, um, which are adopted by the European Council in July, uh, normally. And through these recommendations, we try to, to give the relevant guidance to the member states. And the social uh, country-specific recommendations have been evolving and have been increasing over time. We have, last year, um, issued country-specific recommendations on the access and affordability of childcare services, on the integration of Roma, on uh, make work pay, or on the adequacy of minimum income schemes, only to give you uh, a few examples. And we need to be, uh, we need to be convincing with the member states. It is no, in times of austerity, in times where European solidarity uh, is really difficult to, uh, to achieve, we need to convince member states uh, and it's not, no longer sufficient to simply ring the alarm bell and show the statistics, the extremely alarming statistics. We also need to demonstrate the cost effectiveness and the sustainability of a different approach of investing in human capital, as uh, we have said already, and providing essential and enabling social services. We, as I say, we need to come with very firm analysis for this to, to make sure that member states go in that, in that direction. So we need to uh, be increasing professional in, in, in our function of fighting poverty and social exclusion. And of course we have the financial instruments that my commissioner mentioned, the structural funds, in particular the European Social Fund, for which the Commission is trying to push member states for the new financial perspective 2014-2020 to be more concentrated on social inclusion. Uh, and as I was saying, it's not an easy task because European solidarity nowadays is difficult to maintain. And in terms of policy priorities, you, we've, we've had, we adopted an employment package last year. We've had, we, employ, we adopted a youth package at the end of last year because we know how difficult the situation is for the younger generations. And we know that our societies can, are based on the uh, future for the younger generations. And we have just adopted the social investment package that my commissioner presented. He, the priority is only to nominate a few, is investing in children to break the intergenerational cycle of poverty, notably, notably through investing in early childhood and education. Um, it's also, this also means supporting parents, especially single parents, household, and women's access to labor uh, market, and notably through affordable provision of childcare services. It also means strengthening are active inclusion strategies uh, with, a, with lo looking at the adequacy of minimum income scheme and the methodology to calculate minimum income, the coverage and the take-up rate or the access to enabling services. It also means fighting for deinstitutionalization uh, in a number of our countries still towards more community-based approaches. And as you also have, have heard already, it means really investing in the prevention uh, in prevention policies to fight the most extreme forms of poverty, like homelessness, pushing member states to invest in housing, to use the, ha the houses that exist already, to fight against over-indebtedness and financial exclusion. And for all this in front of us, we obviously uh, need the dialogue with the citizens. This year is the European Year of, of the Citizens, with the civil society and very much uh, in cooperation with the Council of Europe. We, your work at the local level 
is essential as service providers, uh, as assistance to the most vulnerable, as defenders of people's rights. Um, it strengthens our own analysis in the Commission with very relevant data, and it also guides us in through the use of the uh, social funds and the structural funds for which we try to push member states to more social inclusion. And you also bring uh, forward innovative approaches for the fight of, against poverty. And so we worked all together for the common goal for a healthier, more inclusive, cohesive and equal societies, as my commissioner and the secretary general has, have said. This is an everyday fight. So I really thank you all and the Council of Europe for sparing no efforts in this fight and to give and continue giving uh, our populations and our society a sense of hope and perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> then I invite the speaker of the plenary session to take their chair near to me. I'm feeling myself alone. <laughs> Professor Guy Standing, Professor Luciano Gallino. Professor Peter Kenway. This is Claudia Menne. The aim of this session is to present and reconstruct the analysis which are and discuss it, which are the basis of our work is a sort of uh, introductory section. And, uh, and then for this reason, we invite uh, persons that uh, in the last uh, three years, uh, publish a uh, very important uh, contribution on the topic uh, of the distribution of richness uh, in the European society and persons working uh, directly in the trade unions uh, and the association uh, which are dealing with uh, this kind of, of problems. Uh, we will start with uh, Professor uh, Luciano Gallino, who is professor uh, in Turin, is an Italian professor. I think he's uh, the only Italian who is trying to, to see the consequences of what we call uh, economic global globalization and mainly the finan financiarization of economy on the world of the work and on the distribution of richness uh, which is uh, related to the organization of work. Uh, Professor Gallino, we will speak uh, in Italian. Yeah, there is translation uh, there in is French and, and in English. And uh, you can uh, hear the translation in, in English and in French. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Gallino. Bonsoir. Buongiorno a tutti. Il tema del mio intervento sono le interazioni tra crisi economica, disuguaglianza condizioni di lavoro e povertà. Eh, 
riassumo il percorso che hanno seguito queste eh, interazioni. Primo, in primo luogo c'è stata la finanziarizzazione dell'economia che si è accompagnata ad una rilevante distribuzione di reddito e di ricchezza dal basso verso, uh, verso l'alto. Secondo, la redistribuzione ha concorso al peggioramento delle condizioni di lavoro, insieme con altri fattori come la sostituzione del lavoro umano per mezzo dell'automazione e la diffusione del uh, precariato. Abbiamo qui un autorevole autore sul tema del precariato. Terzo, i suddetti processi hanno spinto larghe quote delle classi medie e della classe lavoratrice verso la soglia della povertà relativa o al di sotto di essa. Quarto, il reddito stagnante di queste classi non compensato da un aumento della domanda della classe più benestante, ha provocato una seria caduta sia della domanda aggregata sia degli investimenti eh, produttivi. Quinto, la recessione che ne è seguita, a causa anche delle politiche di austerità che dovevano curarla, hanno prodotto un ulteriore aumento della disoccupazione e dell'occupazione precaria, insieme con un peggioramento delle condizioni di lavoro di, di quelli che eh, un lavoro ancora, uh, ancora uh, ce l'hanno. Dedicherò un minuto o due a ciascuno di questi punti. Primo punto, la redistribuzione di reddito e ricchezza dal basso verso l'alto è confermata da uh, molti indicatori. Tra di essi spicca la forte diminuzione della quota salari a favore dei profitti e delle vendite. Tra il 1976 e il 2006, 30 anni, nei 15 paesi OXE, i cui dati coprono tutto il periodo considerato, la quota dei salari sul valore aggiunto, cioè sul, sul PIL, sul prodotto interno lordo, è diminuita in media di 10 punti, scendendo dal 67 al 57% circa. Sono decine di miliardi in dollari, in euro, in sterline, in quel che si vuole, decine di miliardi l'anno che vanno ai profitti e alle rendite invece che eh, al eh, lavoro, soprattutto alle rendite, eh, alle rendite eh, finanziarie. Punto secondo, un aspetto della finanziarizzazione dell'economia di rilevanza critica per una discussione sulle cause della povertà e i suoi rimedi è costituita dall'estrazione di profitti di profitti finanziari direttamente dal reddito personale delle famiglie. Per molto tempo, per generazioni, i migliori clienti delle banche sono state le grandi imprese. Dal 1980 in poi queste ultime hanno fatto ricorso in misura crescente ai mercati finanziari, riducendo in misura cospicua la domanda dei prestiti e servizi indirizzata alle banche. La necessità di trovare nuove fonti di profitto ha quindi spinto le banche a espandere i servizi finanziari offerti alle famiglie. È nata di qui la fortissima pressione esercitata su di queste, sulle famiglie, in genere famiglie lavoratrici, in molti paesi, dagli Stati Uniti alla Spagna, dal Regno Unito all'Irlanda, affinché sottoscrivano ogni sorta di debito, a cominciare dalla dall'acquisto della casa mediante un mutuo ipotecario, insieme con un uso sempre più eh, esteso, sempre più ampio delle carte, di, eh, delle carte di credito. Terzo punto, dal minore reddito per la gran maggioranza della popolazione, perché eh, i salari sono bassi o perché il reddito è costituito da sussidi di eh, disoccupazione, è derivata una forte e prolungata contrazione della domanda aggregata. I ricchi, essendo pochi, non possono consumare più di tanto. Un economista americano notava di recente che ci sono dei limiti al numero di bottiglie di champagne Don Perignon o degli abiti di Armani 
che i super ricchi acquistano e consumano per proprio conto. Eh, C'è una definizione, come dire, me meno politica di eh, super ricchi, che è quella che usano eh, le istituzioni finanziarie, sono i, eh, gli individui ad altissimo valore netto, con una ricchezza personale al di sopra dei 30 milioni di dollari. E quanto ai poveri eh, sono tanti, ma non hanno i mezzi per sostenere la domanda. Inoltre, politiche fiscali deliberatamente aspre, quali sono state adottate in tutta la UE, in particolare, ma anche in altri paesi non UE, inclusi Italia alla spesa sociale, contribuiscono a frenare ulteriormente la domanda aggregata. Un altro effetto recessivo della finanziarizzazione che compensa sempre di più meno del 10% della popolazione e sottocompensa, ossia sottoretribuisce la gran maggioranza, fino a spingere una quota crescente di essa oltre la soglia della povertà, è la caduta degli investimenti privati e pubblici. A fronte della contrazione della domanda, le imprese non investono perché non sanno chi potranno vendere i loro prodotti in futuro. In molti casi scoprono che gli investimenti già effettuati si sono trasformati in un eccesso di capacità produttiva. Oggi in Europa esiste in molti settori, a cominciare dall'automobile, un enorme eccesso di capacità produttiva. I dati dicono che il tasso di investimento in capitale fisso delle corporations osservabile negli ultimi 10 o 15 anni è molto basso, ad onta di tassi molto elevati di profitto così come sono basse le eh, spese dedicate alla eh, ricerca. Quarto punto, il tentativo di superare la stagnazione dell'economia in corso fin dagli anni Ottanta, con una forte espansione dell'economia finanziaria, <coughs> è stato nell'insieme, dalle due parti dell'Atlantico, un disastro, un drammatico eh, insuccesso. Le politiche di austerità seguite dai governi hanno trasformato la crisi in una recessione sempre più lunga, sempre più prolungata. Nel corso di questa sono decine di milioni che hanno perso il lavoro o tentano a ritrovarlo. Su 36 Paesi sviluppati, a fine 2011, soltanto 6 facevano registrare un tasso di occupazione uguale o più alto a quello del 2007. In tutti gli altri risultava diminuito e l'Organizzazione Internazionale del Lavoro stima in un rapporto di poche settimane fa, stima che ben difficilmente esso tornerà ai livelli pre-crisi prima della fine del 2017. La fine della crisi eh, è stata eh, prevista per il 2012, per il 2013, per il 2014, per il 2015. Adesso siamo intorno al eh, 2017. E questa stessa stima è ormai da considerare piuttosto, uh, piuttosto uh, ottimistica. Nata, ossia originata, dalla diffusione della povertà relativa che ha spinto tra gli anni 90 e i primi anni eh, 2000 gran parte della popolazione a contrarre debiti eccessivi, la crisi è, pre eh, è proseguita dopo il 2007 generando attraverso tra la disoccupazione e la cattiva occupazione, il precariato, altra povertà. I tassi ufficiali di povertà sono aumentati quasi, eh, quasi ovunque. Fine decennio 2010-2011, stando alle rispettive stime nazionali, i poveri erano 50 milioni negli Stati Uniti, oltre il 17% della popolazione, 6 milioni e mezzo in Spagna, 14%, 7 milioni in Italia, 11,5%, quasi 7 milioni nel Regno Unito, l'11%. Per, eh, per so benissimo che eh, a causa della differenza delle monete, dei poteri d'acquisto, eccetera, le, la povertà relativa è una cosa diversa da un Paese eh, all'altro, ma quelle sono le statistiche eh, nazionali che, eh, che, ci, eh, che ci dicono. E a far crescere il tasso di povertà contribuisce anche il numero dei lavoratori poveri, quelli che hanno un lavoro più o meno regolare, ma pagato abbastanza poco da far ricadere loro e i conviventi al di sotto della soglia di povertà. 
Punto quinto. Eh, bisogna notare, eh, notare, con, notare con forza, che i tassi di povertà eh, sono di per sé importanti, sia i tassi della povertà relativa eh, sia i tassi della povertà eh, assoluta. E però non sono adatti per spiegare in modo analitico da dove viene la povertà. E in questo compito ci aiuta una serie supplementare di dati Eurostat pubblicati a fine 2012, un paio di, me un paio di mesi fa. Nel 2011 si annoveravano, entro la UE a 27, 120 milioni di persone, 120 milioni di persone il 24% della popolazione, considerati a rischio di povertà o di eh, esclusione eh, sociale. Eurostat colloca in tale categoria coloro che rientrano in almeno una di queste condizioni. Eh, uno, reddito disponibile dopo i trasferimenti sociali sotto la soglia di povertà del loro Paese. 17% della popolazione della UE27. Secondo, eh, individui o famiglie eh, affetti da severa deprivazione materiale, non possono pagare il riscaldamento o la luce, o la luce elettrica. Terzo, individui tra 0 e 59 anni che fanno parte di famiglie con una bassissima intensità di lavoro. Eh, per bassissima intensità di lavoro si intende eh, famiglie in cui eh, gli adulti hanno lavorato l'anno prima meno del 20% del loro potenziale eh, di lavoro totale. Se potevano prestare per dire eh, 100 ore di, eh, di lavoro, sono riusciti a prestarne, se no, 20. È interessante sottolineare che ci sono delle differenze molto grandi tra i Paesi quanto a rischio povertà, quanto a tasso di deprivazione materiale. Mentre invece eh, la quota di persone che fanno parte di, famiglia, di famiglie a bassissima intensità di lavoro eh, varia soltanto con l'eccezione di Cipro e Lussemburgo tra il 6,5% della Repubblica Ceca e il 13,5% del, del Belgio. Questo è, eh, molto, oh, è molto indicativo. Eh, ne segue che coloro che lavorano oltre i 60 anni sono probabilmente pochi così come sono pochi quelli che eh, lavorano al di sotto dei, in Europa al di sotto dei 14 anni, e si, si può quindi stimare che il numero di persone toccate in totale da una bassissima intensità di lavoro si aggiri nella UE27 tra i 40 e i 45 milioni. Riassumo e concludo. La povertà di oggi, la povertà odierna, è figlia sia del tasso eccessivo di disuguaglianza, che è stato uno dei fattori principali della crisi, sia del degrado delle condizioni di occupazione e di, eh, e di lavoro. L'eccesso di disuguaglianza deriva da decenni di redistribuzione dal basso verso l'alto di reddito e ricchezza eh, indotto in prevalenza dalla finanziarizzazione dell'economia, ma anche dal deterioramento delle condizioni di eh, di lavoro su cui non posso soffermarmi. In questa prospettiva un'efficace azione di contrasto alla povertà dovrebbe comprendere necessariamente due interventi complementari. In primo luogo bisogna fermare la redistribuzione del reddito e della ricchezza dal basso verso l'alto, operando soprattutto sulla distribuzione primaria piuttosto che su quella secondaria, cioè i trasferimenti da parte dello Stato. Una volta che i giochi sono fatti nell'ambito della distribuzione primaria, eh, si può fare qualcosa per eh, rammendare, per riparare eh, il guasto, ma è molto più difficile che non eh, operando alla fonte della disuguaglianza. In secondo luogo bisognerebbe rivedere le connessioni, le interazioni tra finanza ed economia eh, reale riportando questa e i suoi problemi in primo piano, in primissimo piano, nell'agenda dei governi europei, al posto del predominio finora attribuito da questi ultimi ai problemi finanziari. E, eh, per certi aspetti 
per un ricercatore quale io sono, divertente, ma dall'altro anche eh, triste, constatare che i governi europei, non meno di quello americano, hanno assunto dal 2008 un efficace ruolo di operatori keynesiani quasi quale non si vedeva da 80 anni. I governi liberali o neoliberali hanno eh, operato interventi da parte dello Stato quale non si sono eh, mai visti. Uh, un commentatore greco, si può anche capirlo, ha scritto di recente che nemmeno Lenin ha fatto interventi nel campo del, uh, degli interventi nell'economia uh, quando prese il uh, potere tempo dietro. Questo ruolo di operatore keynesiano non è rivolto soprattutto al salvataggio delle istituzioni uh, finanziarie. Le istituzioni finanziarie soltanto oh, nel, uh, nella UE 17 hanno usufruito di 2.000 miliardi di uh, euro di uh, aiuti. Uh, la UE ne aveva stanziati 4.000, a uh, ottobre 2011 ne avevano utilizzati circa uh, 2.000. E, e bisogna pensare anche uh, all'occupazione, perché uh, chi semina soltanto finanza raccoglie soltanto disoccupazione e recessione come sta avvenendo mentre nasce intatti i difetti strutturali alla base della crisi cito Keynes i difetti preminenti della società economica in cui viviamo scriveva il nostro in conclusione la teoria generale che è del 1936 sono il suo fallimento nel provvedere la piena occupazione e la distribuzione arbitraria e ingiusta di ricchezza e redditi Keynes era un ricco signore inglese, eh, certamente non socialista, eh, non di sinistra, non, non altro, che però eh, aveva ben chiari quali erano i eh, problemi già eh, negli anni 30 delle società contemporanee. E sembrerebbe giunta l'ora che i governi europei provassero nuovamente a rivolgere il loro impegno primario alle politiche intese a creare piena occupazione, full employment, come hanno fatto altre volte in passato, perché soltanto da queste può discendere una riduzione eh, tangibile e possibilmente rapida della povertà. Grazie. Thank you very much to Professor Luciano Gallino. Uh, Professor Luciano Gallino has recently edited the book, uh, published the book, uh, about uh, the class struggle uh, after the class struggle <laughs> in maintaining uh, this uh, banalizing uh, his uh, thesis that uh, now there is the struggle of uh, the richness against the poor uh, which are subtracting them uh, a lot of uh, richness uh, in our guide we had uh, one concrete proposal uh, which is uh, to, fis to fix uh, uh, a maximum spread, uh, for using this word that now is on the spot, uh, uh, between uh, the income of the richness and the income of uh, the poor, in the sense that uh, uh, if uh, the income of the rich increase, uh, the, in the income of the poor uh, should increase uh, in the same quantity. Then there is a maximum spread, the maximum difference. It can be 200 times, 300 times, but it has to be fixed. For us, this is a way of giving a concretization to the principle of social solidarity, which is in all the European constitutions. And it is a way of forcing rich people to say, to realize that if they want to earn more, they have to assure that uh, even poor people should earn more in the same percentage. This is the risk. In your opinion, can be a solution for, uh, let me say, moderating the new class struggle or not? Well, it can be a, a step toward... Uh, <coughs> it, it can be a step toward... Uh, uh, a, a solution, but uh, uh, the, the gap uh, you, you, you quoted, uh, 300 to 1, uh, 4 to 1, 
in any case is uh, uh, very, very large, possibly uh, too large. Uh, the problem, the trouble is uh, that uh, uh, rich people uh, do not love investment. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the amount of, uh, uh, of riches, the amount of money, the amount of stocks uh, the, 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 that uh, they put together uh, are no use of any usefulness to the real uh, economy, to full employment, to fight the poverty and, and so on, because they do not uh, uh, invest. They uh, play uh, with the money uh, in order to get uh, other money. There is a, a lot of uh, data uh, about, uh, about this. So I, I would uh, appreciate this, uh, this proposal, but I should cut a, a bit uh, the, uh, the spread. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we welcome uh, uh, Mrs. Sepulveda. Uh, who reached out, uh, she had the problem yesterday night with the Swiss train, even the Swiss train have a problem, this is a discovery. <laughs> Thank you very much to reach us. And um, uh, I give the floor to Professor Guy Standing. Professor Guy Standing is uh, an economist, he's working at the University of London, and uh, his last book is uh, Precariat, Precariat a Dangerous Class, uh, which uh, mean uh, push us uh, uh, towards uh, a problem which is one of the main problem uh, of the European society, not only of the European society, uh, which is the problem of the precarious uh, workers. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to try to use my few minutes uh, to suggest that we are at a fascinating point in history when we're at the cusp of a new global transformation in which a new progressive politics is rapidly taking shape. It is not a time to feel sorry for ourselves. It is a time for regeneration of a progressive agenda. And I think that one must recall Gramsci's famous saying about the period when the old is dying and there are mordant symptoms, and the new is just waiting to emerge. Now, in my remarks, I'm going to draw on two books, one that has been just mentioned and another is called Work After Globalization. I have a few copies if anybody's interested after I've finished my talk. And I want to make a few contextual remarks. First, I think, although neoliberalism and neoliberals are still in power. I think it is the power of the damned. When all they can do now is impose more pain and more deprivation through austerity regimes. It is not the power to transform society in the ways that they did at the beginning of the globalization period. And what we're seeing, in fact, is a malevolent utilitarianism which is dominating politics, where appeals are constantly being made both by social democrats and by the right to the middle class, as if you could go for a majority and their happiness and never mind everybody else. This is the period in which the panopticon state is being strengthened and used against those people who are losing in this society. And I want to refer back now to the nature of globalization that has been taking place in the last three decades. Essentially, it was a period of liberalization, of mass commodification of every aspect of life, and of re-regulation. Anybody who says this was a period of deregulation should be encouraged to take up gardening or sewage cleaning because they don't know anything about economics or anything about labor markets. 
It's a period of re-regulation and re-regulation in directing people how to behave and how not to behave and imposing more and more conditionality on access to social entitlements. We must also realize that it's a period of globalization in which global markets were being constructed and which Chindia, the emerging market economies, effectively trebled global labor supply almost overnight, historically speaking. In doing so, they weakened the power of workers in the rich countries, in Europe in particular, and strengthen the power of capital. Now, as an economist, you don't have to have a PhD to know that once you go for that, in those circumstances, you are automatically going to multiply the inequalities in society, and in particular, increase the functional inequality between capital and labor. You don't have to be a genius to see that. And the economists who proposed this strategy in the 1980s knew very well that it was going to result in increases in equality. But in effect, what happened was they made a Faustian bargain with us. The Faustian bargain went as follows. They knew that wages and benefits and standard of living in our countries would fall for the majority, because you had to have a convergence. As wages and benefits rose slightly in the emerging market economies, wages and benefits would fall in the rich countries. And the Faustian bargain was that they knew that they couldn't allow wages and benefits to fall very rapidly, and so they introduced more and more subsidies, tax credits, various cheap credit schemes, various schemes to an allow an orgy of consumption. An orgy of consumption which resulted in mass indebtedness that was deliberately created in order to, to allow the system to persist. But in the process, there was a slow and deliberate dismantling of institutions and policies of social solidarity. If you read the early works of Hayek and Milton Friedman and the other great neoliberals, you will see that this was their number one priority, to dismantle collective institutions of voice and solidarity. It's not an incidental outcome. It was a deliberate outcome. Now, what we've seen, of course, is this growing inequality and a Faustian bargain in which the restructuring of social protection also took place. Across Europe and North America and Japan, there was a shift to means testing, to targeting, to selectivity, to conditionality multiplying what I call not only poverty traps, but pre precarity traps that I discuss in the books. And in the process, as wages and benefits fell, we had a process of class fragmentation. Now, I think it's important to focus on class, whether one takes this perspective or the perspective that I'm presenting, because class identifies where there is agency, where there is voice potential in society. Now, the class fragmentation has involved a plutocracy, a tiny number, 0.1%, not 1%. A long way below them is a salariat, still with long-term employment security and access to bonuses and access to paid holidays and retreats in wonderful places where they play golf and things like that. And alongside the salariat of proficients, a growing number of project-oriented people flitting around. Below them, in terms of income, is the old working class, the proletariat, that Andre Gores said was dying or dead. It's shrinking, but we must remember that the social model, so-called, of Europe 
was based on that class interest. And that is not the future. It's below that that the precariat has been taking shape. And below the precariat, a lumpen precariat, are people who are social victims outside the mainstream of society. That's the first point I want to make, which is that the precariat is wanted by capital. It is a class in the making, in the Marxian sense. It is not an underclass. It's very important because the characteristics of the precariat define the greatest challenges ahead. One can think of a number of definitional aspects, and I'm just going to highlight very few because I have a limited time. One is that the precariat experiences insecure labor relations. Casualized, you know it, all that, those symptoms of flexibility. The second key point is that they have distinctive relations of distribution in the sense that they don't have access to state benefits that are assured, that are secure. They don't have access to enterprise benefits of non-wage benefits. And they don't have access to community benefits either. Also part of the precariat is a distinctive form of status frustration. This is the first time in history when we have an emerging class whose education and qualifications are above the labor they are expected to perform. Anybody who says that investing more in human capital is the answer to the existing crisis, again, should be encouraged to take up gardening. We have more educated people experiencing status frustration and deprivation of various sorts than at any time in history. So to say that more of that is the answer means your question was bloody stupid. That doesn't mean that we should not have more education. Of course we should. But it's not the answer to a structural crisis. Now, unlike the proletariat, the precariat is being habituated gradually through actions of the state to a life of unstable labor expected to be unstable in their work and labor. But another feature of the precariat, which I urge all of us to think about, is that those in the precariat have to perform an extraordinary amount of work for labor that is not counted as labor. We need to radically overhaul our labor statistics because they systematically under-record the amount of work that people are doing in society, and particularly those in the precariat. The precariat are also denizens, not citizens. Denizen is an old 13th century concept referring to people who were given a limited range of rights that were not equal to those of the citizens. But we are in a, an era when, for the first time, we are systematically seeing the state turning citizens into denizens, chipping away at all five of those forms of rights that we talk about all the time, chipping away at civil rights, no due process when benefits are taken away, chipping away at social rights, various ways you deny people social rights, chipping away at cultural rights, chipping away at political rights, and most of all, chipping away at economic rights. Too little attention has been given to the incredible re-regulation of occupational practices in the last 20 or 30 years, where we've had a shift to the state regulations of the right to practice. This is the first time in history where the state has taken away the capacity to regulate our occupational life and has used it for creating fragmentation within occupational communities. Now, in the development of denizens, more and more people are being converted into supplicants, into begging for entitlements. 
Precariousness is not just about insecure labor, it's about being a supplicant, begging, pleading with authorities, with authorities that are unaccountable, commercialized, and are treating the precariat as objects to be changed for the benefit of other people. Again, be very suspicious when you hear of politicians talking about how wonderful active labor market policies are. Active for whom? Turning people into what the state wants them to be. Now, ultimately, the precariat is defined by an absence of occupational identity, an absence of an occupational narrative to give to one's life. I am becoming something. I am something. And then in my old age, I was something. The precariat cannot give that narrative to its life. Now, at the moment, the precariat is at war with itself. There are varieties of precariat. There are those people coming out of working class communities who are feeling relatively deprived because they cannot get what their parents had. There are the migrants, the Roma, the minorities who keep their head down and are politically detached because that's the only way to survive. But it's the young, educated people who are in the Indignado movement, who are in the Den Plurona movement in, in Greece and various other groups, who are in the groups that I find myself invited to talk to around the world, in the Occupy movement and elsewhere. Now, I don't have time to go into why the growth has taken place in the precariat. It's discussed in the books. But we all know the Faustian bargain came to an end in 2008. The orgy of consumption crashed. And now the neoliberal state is turning around and saying, you have to pay for all the debt. You, the people, have to pay with the austerity regime. Now, I talk in the book about the danger of a politics of inferno and the possibility of a politics of paradise emerging in the near future. And I'd like to end my remarks with some principles. I think we are at that cusp where we have a crisis in the sense of Karl Polanyi's crisis of his great transformation. But this is the global transformation. And I think in thinking of where the progressive politics and policies are going to come from, we need to remember three principles which the political parties of the left in particular have forgotten in the last few years. The first principle is that every new forward march towards more equality, more freedom, and more fraternity is defined by the emerging mass class. It's not going to be defined by the poor. The poor have no agency. It isn't a concept that is active. The emerging mass class is the precariat. The second principle to remember is that every new forward march is defined by new forms of collective action, of voice in society, bargaining for the redistribution that we heard about that is necessary. Now here, we have seen days of action and a lot of activities, and I'll come back briefly if I have a moment at the end. The third great principle is that every new forward march is about three overlapping struggles. The first struggle is a struggle for recognition, a struggle for identity. Now, there we made great progress in 2011. 
the Occupy movement, the Indignado movement, the, the various actions that took place were about identity, were about agency. I am a member of the precariat. I am a member of a group and I am proud of it because I share it with many millions of other people. The second great <laughs> principle is a struggle for representation. And here we are way behind where we need to be. When we talk about rights, when we talk about inequality, we must get representation for the group that is most at the forefront of the challenge. We don't have the precariat represented in social agencies. We don't have the precariat represented in various institutions, either at the supranational level or at the national or local level. We need the precariat in every social agency, in every occupational board. And the third and final struggle is a struggle for redistribution. And the redistribution that we are going to see that struggling for is of the key assets of a tertiary society. It's not the struggle for the means of production in the old socialist model of the early 20th century. We have to think of what are the key assets of the precariat. And I tell you that it's very easy to define those key assets. And if you have a meeting of the precariat, they'll all understand you very, very clearly. The first is we need a redistribution of security. The second, we need a redistribution of control over time. The precariat has no control over its time. It must flit between activities. It must chase what others tell them to chase. We need a politics of time. There is time poverty as well as income poverty. The third asset is public quality space, the commons. The commons, as we know, have been chipped away with the closure of public facilities, of public toilets, and chipping away at amenities that the precariat need more than any other group. The next key asset is financial knowledge and knowledge in general. We need a strategy to decommodify education, turn it away from human capital and turn it into what education is about, liberating creative energies, liberating ourselves. And finally, we need a strategy for redistributing financial capital. Without that, we have no redistribution. Now, the last point I want to make before the chairman hits me is that one of the strategies that I and a number of people in this room have been pushing for many years is a basic income as a right for all. As a right, not as conditional targeted benefit, but as a right. When we set up Bien 30 years ago, people laughed at us. I've been twice dismissed from my jobs in the International Labour Organization for holding to this principle. But gradually the world has been changing. In early 1990s, when we went to Brazil, I spoke about basic income in Brazil. People laughed and said it's impossible. Today, more than 60 million Brazilians and many others in other Latin American countries are receiving what is in effect a basic income. I don't like the conditionality, but that's chipping away. We then launched a scheme, a group of us, some of us in this room were involved in Namibia, a basic income for everybody in some villages. And I know you know about this scheme. But since then, something much greater has been happening. With SEWA, the Self-Employed Women's Association of India, we launched three basic income pilot schemes in three parts of India. For three years, we've been conducting it where every man, every woman, and every child has been receiving an unconditional basic income. We've seen the transformation of lives better nutrition, better school attendance, better school performance, better status for women, better productivity, less income inequality in those villages. And most miraculously of all, 
In December, the Prime Minister of India, a country of 1.2 billion people, went on television and said that his government were converted to cash transfers. Now, if it can happen in India, if it can happen in a small part of Africa, and it can happen in various parts of Latin America, it can happen in Europe, around us. But we need the courage to struggle for that and to demand it. And I hope that some of you in this room will take that struggle forward. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Guy. Now I introduce uh, Dr. Peter Kinway, uh, who is the director of the New Policy Institute. Uh, the institute is uh, focusing on social justice and the market economy. He will speak to us uh, about the poverty or inequality. Yes. That's uh, the or, I think, is the fundamental aspect. <laughs> and uh, I give him the floor. And uh, Emilio, how much time do you want to give me? A quarter of an hour. A quarter of an hour, thank you very much. Um, we are in the poverty. Uh, yes, yes, that's all right. We yeah. are, as the guy told us, uh, even of time. I'm going to come back to that. <laughs> He's quite right. Uh, I'd like to thank Gilles de Farrell for inviting me. It, it's, uh, there was some introduction that said we'd been doing work in the last three years. We ourselves have not done an any work with uh, Gilda and her colleagues for several years, more than three. Uh, and I was wondering uh, why uh, she had kindly invited me. And I think the conclusion is that she wanted, uh, it's a position I'm not used to being in, she wanted somebody uh, on the uh, right wing to uh, give an opinion uh, on this subject. So uh, I will stick to my, my time brief. and I. To some extent, I want to be, uh, I will be provocative, uh, and I, I, I want to challenge at the end, really, uh, the idea that uh, this discourse, this stream of work that has been running for many years should embrace inequality as well as poverty as it's one of its key ideas. I think for what is being attempted and sought here, inequality is a dangerous concept. Obviously, academically it is not, but I think politically it is. So I'm going to argue uh, for poverty rather than inequality, um, and to some extent uh, I'm doing that to uh, be uh, provocative. I think the debate is not as hard and clear-cut as I'm going to make it sound. Now, what I am going to talk about uh, is really reflect upon the uh, the public and the, the political discussion around poverty in the United Kingdom, Great Britain, the words that have been used and the ideas that they embody. And one thing that I've learnt from being at gatherings like this is that this is difficult. Now, it's not difficult because of problems with the translation, uh, it's difficult because I think context is all. That's the social, the political, historical, cultural. And I believe, and I certainly believe this, uh, I suspect you would agree, someone coming from the United Kingdom, our contexts are different. And I think it's a question which I th think is a crucial question to the whole issue being discussed here, is whether there is in any way a meaningful European, common European context, or whether the differences, the subtle differences, that you can only really understand, I believe, by living uh, in the different European countries, whether those differences, in fact, are still extremely important and thwart uh, us, thwart common attempts to address this question. I'm also very concerned about a paradox, as it seems to me. In many respects, and I think what Guy Standing said uh, touched upon this, uh, 
the poverty concept, the idea of poverty is less useful, it's less appropriate, it's less in focus. Uh, on the other hand, the pressure on people who are poor, the burden on them, the threat to them, I think is greater than at any time since the 1930s. And one of my worries is that those of us who've been working in this subject for a long time are like, you know the story of the boy who cried wolf. My worry is that having talked about poverty in the good times, we are uh, ill-equipped when something in a way far worse has comes along and is coming along now. So very briefly, a little bit of history. Poverty entered the political lexicon in Britain in the late 1990s, and it did so because the government decided that it would become its responsibility. And that, I think, meant three things. First, by the government saying that, it agreed that it existed. Previously, it had been denied. As late as 1996, no such thing as poverty from a government minister. Second, this point about scale, it said broadly one in five people are in poverty. And that's a, the scale itself is terribly important uh, because if you believe it's one in five, you come up with very different explanations from if you believe it's, say, one in 500. And the third point was that really by the nature of the way that it's measured in the way we're all used to in re re relation to this median income, 60% of median, what the government's commitment to do something about poverty meant in graphic terms was simply that the bottom, the bottom fifth, should no longer fall further away from the middle, but should actually close the gap on the middle. And that drew a correct lesson from the 1980s that the great growth in poverty in the 1980s was not during that recession at the very beginning of that decade, but the growth really kicks in when the growth starts in the middle of the decade. The, the, the middle pulls away, the bottom of the income distributions get stuck. This was a simple message. I think it was a small C conservative message. It's a one nation message, to use another British term. And it's an unthreatening message. And for five years or six years, it happened. The government succeeded in moving things in the right direction. And as long as that picture held, then this story of poverty as a story about the bottom moving towards the middle remained valid and adequate. When did it go wrong? It's not 2007. It's several years before that. We think with hindsight, and this is all with hindsight, the key year was 2004. Three things happen. Uh, something goes badly wrong with the economy, uh, growth comes to depend upon debt, household debt and public debt. Earnings, earnings in the middle stop growing, 2003, 2004. And young adult unemployment starts to rise. Initially, a year later, you see child poverty statistics starting to rise, the government responds by putting more money into it. That in its own right had certain distortionary effects, but those are perhaps sort of details for, 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 for Britain a, a alone. Um, but what I think this did was to shatter the basis on which that very comfortable story about how poverty was going to be reduced, eventually eradicated, the basis for that story was destroyed. Now, the malfunctioning of our economies, and Professor Galino's talk was extremely interesting uh, in that regard, uh, 
we see as the proximate cause of this. My only difference with Professor Galina, we are very struck by the way, it's less about the rich so much as uh, a change in behavior by corporations that became, have become chronic net savers. There's been corporate hoarding for 12, 13 years and that causes economic problems. But the economics is only the proximate cause. We see three other causes driving it. One is demographic, the big swings in the birth rate in the 60s and the 70s and beyond make a lot of difference. But increased life expectancy, growing numbers of older people remaining in the labor market by necessity or choice. It's growing role of women in the labor market and then the converse questions around the conduct and organization and support for family life and ballooning numbers with degrees in higher education. Uh, and a very important thing to remember is that all those three things are goods. They're good things. No one in this room would dispute any of them. And yet they are part of the set of factors driving things. And it opens up new fault lines and new conflicts. Now, some are very vivid. Age is one that you can immediately provoke a substantial interest from the media in, if you say this is a young v old thing. Because um, everyone's involved, you're all in it one way or the other. Um, I believe it's a superficial perspective but I'm also very clear that, and this is true of my colleagues who are 20 years younger than me, <coughs> you might find it surprising that I could have colleagues 20 years, but colleagues 20 years younger than me don't see things the same way as I do. Um, a much more fundamental fault line, which I don't think Guy mentioned, and I did expect him to, there's a whole question around access to housing and security of housing, uh, the, the housing and housing tenure has been the important thing really in British political life and I think elsewhere. And what we're now seeing is a huge growth of very expensive, very insecure private rental. The return of private rental, which in Britain for a long time was marginalized and regarded as a, a, not the same I think as in France and Germany where that's an acceptable and can be a stable tenure. So there are real issues around that. And of course, within this, other concepts have emerged to challenge poverty. Now, one that's quite interesting in Britain is the concept of the squeezed middle. The squeezed middle is problematic. If by the squeezed middle, you mean that the middle is being pushed down upon, fine. But it has another meaning or another image, which is the middle being squeezed between a greedy rich and a feckless poor. And that is a right-wing populist version of it, and it's very dangerous. And I think one of the things about the squeezed middle is that it sits there and you can believe which you like. And I think it's a dangerous concept. The other concept that has come in, of course, is inequality. Now, my problem with inequality, on the one hand, it's much more radical and ambitious. But who's it about? It's never about us. It's always about someone else. In this room, in a meeting of the salariats, and I think probably it will be about the bankers and, you know, that is... Again, Guy said, you know, it's 0.1 of a percent, you know, tiny fractions of a percent. But there'll be plenty of people, and there'll be some in this room, who will see us as part of that inequality that needs to be reduced. And I think the difficulty with inequality is that it's... Gilda talked about universalism. Um, I, I think inequality, and I, I absolutely agree, it's a huge problem. I'm not disputing that. I'm talking about it as a, as a kind of a political motif. I think it is threatening, and it 
does not help to build the degree of support or at least acquiescence that one, I think, needs if you want to change things. So for my part, I still want, for positive reasons, to keep poverty and combating poverty as the preeminent concept. Take this with two, I think, final developments from this. On the one hand, poverty covers a large number of people in different situations. On one side of it, let's call it the upper edge. You have the in-work, the working poor. Now, it's not a new phenomenon, but certainly in Britain, it's now well in excess of half of those of working age are and poor are in work. It does seem to me that this group do not differ qualitatively from people somewhat higher up the income scale. Uh, they face an intensity, a greater intensity of problems, but their problems are not that different. Uh, Guy made a very, I think, very important point that I've not heard too many people make, which is really this concept that you can be short of time and short of money. And I think the, the key thing about the in-work point is in many ways that double shortage. And I think it's possible, and I'd be interested, perhaps we will discuss this outside the, this session, whether in some sense the, the in-work poor, who clearly have uh, overlaps with, with uh, guys precariat, whether in some sense this represents every man, or whether these, the people in this situation, if you like, embody the general interest. If you advance their interest, you are actually also advancing interests of people who are also in work further up the income scale, maybe in more secure uh, work. So, on the one hand, I want to stick with in work poor, <laughs> because I, I think it's a valuable concept. On the other edge, what is, and I'd be very interested to know how far this is happening outside of Britain, those who are already poor are under huge attack. And that attack takes the form of cuts in services, in benefits, penalties for people deemed to be occupying homes that are too large for them when they have nothing else offered to them. And the most extraordinary thing of all, increases in taxes specifically for the poor. Now, one of the difficulties with this, I'm nearly ready, to, I'm almost ready to talk, is that this in a way is done in the name, not of equality, but is done in the name of fairness. That it's fair in times of austerity that everybody should take their share of the reduction in income. Now, this is an absurd idea. If your back is to the wall, the fair share that you can afford to bear is nil. Nevertheless, and this is not just a kind of a right-wing thing. The idea somehow that the fair, fair cuts are ones that hit everybody with a similar percentage has quite a lot of traction, and it's nonsense. And it seems to me that poverty alone has within it this idea, this absolute element to it, that these people are in a situation where they cannot bear any cut don't think inequality quite has that capacity to, 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 to do that. My very last point is about what is happening. Another aspect of this. Uh, again, Guy mentioned the word, I think he used the word supplicant. One of the things that is happening as our welfare state is being eroded, nothing so vulgar as dismantled, but being eroded. One thing that's happening is that rights are turning into things that the local state can grant, has discretion over. So you move from a situation where you have a set of rights, however grim the conditionality may be, nevertheless, if you jump over all the hurdles, go through all the hoops, you have a right to it, to a position where you essentially, there's a limited pot, local criteria will apply, they will be applied by bureaucrats, you may get something and you may not. And so I think the rights element, all of this is immensely defensive. And while I'd like to agree that we are uh, on the cusp of perhaps moving forward, I think that might be right. The very immediate crisis challenge we face is of people with nothing 
to spare, having money taken away and having rights taken away. And poverty, it seems to me, is the only, is the best concept for trying to arch over that and to argue that where once we did not want the poor, we wanted the poor to catch up with the middle, now it must at least be that the poor are not made worse off materially or in terms of rights. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, this is the time of Claudia Menne, who is uh, the Confederal Secretary of the European Trade Union Confederation, then uh, one of the main actors in this debate. Then, uh, Claudia, you have the floor. Yes, yeah, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for the organizers. And um, after these very interesting contributions, uh, which is not my primary task to comment on it, but uh, nevertheless, I'm uh, influenced by what I heard from the three speakers. I know that um, the situation of being here as a trade unionist is not that uh, easy, maybe, because we always regard it more or less as those who are protecting people who are still in employment and who are protecting a specific group. Um, but nevertheless, I'm invited to uh, speak about our position with regard to the EU developments and um, if I may take uh, the view of Guy Standing, I should leave the panel before because I should, be guard should do gardening because I will speak about deregulation and I will speak also about active labour market policies. Um, and it's not my personal view only, but it's a, the view of, uh, of our confederation and of uh, the trade unions in Europe and uh, maybe it should be better to do gardening because then my personal life would be uh, much easier and uh, I could live with my family and I could live with my husband throughout the week. And it's also the same situation, not only for me, but for a lot of my colleagues. Uh, for example, those who are in struggle in Spain, the trade unions who did, uh, in my opinion, a very good job and very bravest job in the last two years. Uh, it's just to give you an, an anecdotal evidence that there have been a lot of people uh, problems, heart attacks, and so on and so on, because they're really suffering personally, psychologically, of what is happening. And just to call some other things is, for example, last yesterday there was a general, general strike in Greece. It's not only the trade unions, it's a social movement. We together try to convince politicians that they're on the wrong track. Or another example is there is a mass rally today in Belgium organized by the trade unions to uh, counteract against austerity. And this is exactly what we need. We need discussion, we need exchange, we need uh, also input from academics. We are very uh, privileged as European Trade Union uh, Confederation. We have an institute which helps us also to build our political opinion based on, on academic research, but also based on, on the work together with the NGOs in this room. So, therefore, what is our position on the actual situation? What is our analysis? I was asked for it, and what could be our concrete uh, proposals, how we can continue the work together. And the first of our goal is, in all these debates, to recall that the EU has a social objective, and this is embedded in the treaty. It is part of the acquis communautaire, and this is support social progress, high level of employment, improved living and working conditions, advancements of proper social protection, and dialogue between management and labor. All these principles are there, and uh, member states agreed on it. But what we also say is this social objective cannot be reached without social policies implemented, and at all levels, regional level, local levels, government level, but also EU level. And what we are witnessing now is that Commissioner Anders spoke about the social investment package, for example, he launched yesterday. What the policy is all about is now to have restricted budgets and to use them better, to perform better, and there is no, no light in the end of the tunnel which says that we not in additional investment for social purpose and for social uh, progress or even for um, investment plans to relaunch growth and employment. There are some proposals in the, on the table from the trade unions how we could relaunch growth and how we could also um, have 
better employment conditions, and we are happy to discuss it with everybody. We call it a new Marshall Plan for Europe. And we say that the aim of Europe's social policy cannot restrict itself to balancing the negative social consequences of the crisis or the general internal market in general. And I just mentioned it, our concern is now that the policy which has been embedded in the last, over the last two or three years especially, um, is something what we can call um, mutually enforcing policies and uh, also a consensus uh, which is always needed but this consensus leads us in the complete opposite direction, and it has been mentioned before, increasing inequality, increasing poverty, and uh, also working poor, precariat is growing, and all this leads us to the complete opposite, and even the ministers of social affairs and employment who will meet this month uh, by the end of February next week, this week or next week, they already admitted in their draft report that uh, Europe is in a bad shape when it comes to social cohesion, and uh, that they will not fulfill the targets which were mentioned this morning. So, um, therefore, we need radical changes, uh, that's clear, and we need new politics in place, and uh, we are ready to work together with all these forces which are mentioned as progressive or alternative, and to, to debate how we can move forward the EU, but not only the EU, but EU is part of a globalized world, and we have also the, uh, the task to preserve not only our social model, but also to, to improve the living conditions and the social policy uh, framework conditions in other parts of the world. It cannot be that others are saying to us now, you have to look at what is going on in other parts of, of the world, like Asia or China, and this is the future for everybody. So, therefore, um, one of our key message, it must not be a, price, a surprise for you, is that we say we need social dialogue. May let it be bilateral or trilateral, tripartite, um, because what we know also evidence is there from research that shows that where is high levels of bargaining coverage, uh, inequalities are reduced. And where is a protected labor market, also inequalities are less evident. And therefore, I speak about deregulation because I myself, I'm working in the trade union movement for, for 25 years, and I was part of this movement who fought against the Schröder administration and the agenda which was put in place in Germany, like the UK example also. And we tried to convince a left-wing government at that time not to put all these measures in place, which, which produces high inequalities in Germany, a policy which is now... Uh, how can you say, um, exported by Mrs. Merkel to the rest of Europe. And, uh, for example, the German trade union movement tries to explain what has happened in Germany so that not our colleagues in other countries can understand better what is behind these kind of policies. And we clearly say, uh, which is also in line what you heard already here, wage earners cannot, cannot be made responsible for key mistakes in macroeconomic policies and pay the cost for excessive casino capitalism. Um, as I said, what we witness and what we see is a deregulation and a, a neglection of uh, social dialogue. And when I use the term from Guy Standing that he said, a struggle for representation, this is exactly where we are also in now, uh, that we try to be part of the solution. We, we say we don't, we are, not part, we are not part of the problem, as many may say, but we are part of the solution. And that does mean we need social dialogue. Not, it's not always easy with the employer side or with governments, but this is uh, the explicit uh, belief of the, EU, of the European Trade Union Confederation. I can quote one of our last executives which said, um, we are still pro-European, we believe in the European integration project, we want to promote it, um, we don't want to be part, part of those who are Euroscepticism, and, uh, but we want to be heard and we want to be part uh, of the debates. Um, and we, we agree that governments use the crisis as a pretext to introduce uh, such an agenda where they introduce uh, working poor explicit, explicitly and where they deregulate the labor market. And um, therefore our message is that it is paradoxical and dangerous to weaken the systems and institutions that are in place and that allow to reducing inequalities. 
Um, but income, especially income inequality, but other forms of inequality depends not only on uh, employment or unemployment, but also of, um, as we said, redistribution policies. And we are also joining all these forces at, at national le states or national levels, uh, which are calling for a better redistribution or redistribution policies. And in a nutshell, um, all these different movements in the different member states are spelled out differently according to the national systems, but uh, it goes in the line that we need higher taxation of high and very high incomes. Um, we emphasize the importance of quality of employment, jobs with decent work, jobs compatible with skills, jobs with uh, sovereignty of, of time, um, the time we try to um, uh, renegotiate or revise the working time directive at EU level in the last nine months, nine months with the employers, but there was no agreement, so these negotiations failed. For example, the employers did not agree uh, to have a phasing out of the opt-out option to this working time directive. They still want that this option is in the working time directive so that member states and sectors can opt out from the working time directive. Uh, we know that the crisis proved that younger workers, it was mentioned, and older workers are more fragile and vulnerable um, to the crisis. We heard about uh, the demographic change as a long-term challenge for Europe and for all societies, and uh, therefore special instruments. And there it comes in active labor market policies. The key word is needed. That does mean targeted measures, in our opinion. We adopted a framework of inclusive labor markets where we developed some ideas how these kind of inclusive labor markets can be shaped. Um, because I agree with all those who say that full employment is one of the key factors and full employment with a de decent income to prevent uh, poverty. Um, and the last point I want to make is that uh, and to contribute to the debate of today and tomorrow, it was already mentioned, the basic income concept uh, which will be uh, discussed tomorrow we are more critical to this, it's also maybe not a secret in this room, but nevertheless we had uh, adopted a position in our last Congress that uh, we are pro first of all supporting introduction of social minimum incomes in all member states and that we have to define joint uh, principles at EU level. For example, in Greece it's a real problem that there is no social income for the time being now with the long-term unemployment because there is no social protection for those who are protect, uh, for those who are unemployed more than 12 months. So uh, we are very uh, ready to discuss with you and with everybody this critical concept in our opinion of a basic income and how we can confront this with our uh, ideas of social income and also minimum wages because uh, you see it also in this uh, issue of this book which is, has been distributed to you that it's quite uh, not a joint opinion still, but it's still a political struggle uh, where, we, where we want to jointly, um, jointly um, go for, for which goal. Uh, and very concretely, we will have a meeting end of March. We invited the European Anti-Poverty Network to discuss this concept uh, together with our trade union colleagues, and we will contribute to this debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>
should even do more, try to lead uh, the protection of rights. What I'm going to talk today, um, it is a, it's a concept that has been already addressed and touched upon by my predecessors. And I'm going to speak about the deep-seated stigma and prejudice against the poor. I'm going to uh, focus on the stigma uh, and um, prejudice against the poor. I'm going to stress that this uh, stigma, it's so rooted in our society that they inform public policies, making them not only unsustainable, but violating the rights of people living in poverty. And I'm going to argue that a human rights approach to poverty, it is a, it's a crucial tool to combat uh, stigma and prejudice. And finally, I'm going to try, if the time allows me, to provide very concrete recommendations on how to tackle uh, a stigma. In my work, I often hear that persons living in poverty are lazy, irresponsible, indifferent to their children's health and education, dishonest, undeserving, and even criminals. In rich and poor countries, poverty is considered a personal failing, the result of not taking responsibility for one's own life. Those living in poverty are considered the author of their own misfortune, who can remedy their situation by simply trying harder or working harder. Interestingly, interestingly I encountered this prejudice against the poor, as I said, in developed and in developing countries. In European countries, there is a paradox for me coming from the South, because I think that there are different attitudes regarding the poor at home and those abroad. While people seem to have empathy with those living in poverty abroad, far away in the third world countries, they do not feel the same empathy with those living in poverty in their own country, in their own city, and in their own neighborhoods. On the contrary, they see those receiving social assistance as happy living in supposedly generous government handout, without any intention to seeking work, taking responsibility for their well-being, or providing better life for their children. The use of expressions such as benefit scrounger, welfare dependent, and handouts are becoming increasingly more common from politicians in Europe. And this is, this is very regrettable. These popular prejudices and stereotypes are often reinforced by bias and sensationalist media report that particularly targets those living in poverty who are victim of multiple forms of discrimination, such as single mother, ethnic minorities, the Roma in Europe, asylum seekers and migrants. The most worrying aspect, and this is what I would like to argue, is that these prejudices are so deeply entrenched that they often inform public policy making. When social policies are based on these prejudices, as is commonly the case, for example, when, uh, when uh, we are uh, considering people that they are dependent uh, on, uh, or when they are considering or these policies are designed trying to avoid certain, uh, the tendency that these people always consider criminal try to commit fraud, when they're based in this wrong stereotype, these laws and policies are ineffective, unsustainable, and even worse, are responsible for violating the rights of those living in poverty. By their demeaning and degrading nature, this prejudice against the poor goes directly against the idea of dignity that human rights norms seek, seek to protect. Thus, policy based on this prejudice tend to deny the dignity and autonomy of the people living in poverty and fail to recognize that they should enjoy the rights and freedoms in equal manner with the rest of the population. As a consequence of these policies, or as a consequence, sorry, these policies fail to tackle the, systemi the systemic factors that prevent persons living in poverty from overcoming their situation. Social policies based on these prejudices perpetuate and exacerbate social exclusion. When poverty reduction measures or uh, welfare benefits are designed from this narrow perspective, as, in, 
as it is the case, for example, when strict and often absurd requirements and conditionalities are imposed to welfare recipients, they not only tend to ignore the rights of those living in poverty to exercise their autonomy and to take their own decisions in matters affecting their life, but they are, these policies, in, when they are designed on the basis of this wrong prejudice, they are designed if, as if they were, or applied as, as if they were, people living in poverty were subject of charity instead of rights holders entitled to exercise their rights on an equal basis with the rest of the population. While this negative prejudice and stereotypes have always existed in society, one of my main fears now is that the current political environment seems to be in strengthening this ideological agenda and providing the perfect opportunity to impose it on policy making to the detriment of people living in poverty. In recent years, social policies based on these prejudices have been adopted with increasing frequency due to the economic and financial crisis, as certain politicians take advantage of increased social tensions and strained resources. When these measures are implemented alongside rhetoric that suggests that they will ensure only that the serving poor are receiving support, they gain political traction. I am afraid that some politicians and policymakers are taking advantage of the current environment to impose these devastating policies against the poor, without public debate, without examining the disproportionate impact on the poorest and more marginalized, and without real evidence to, to sustain such policies. To justify these measures, state point to the need to make efficient use of public resources, improve the accuracy of targeting, avoid dependency, eliminate this incentive to work, and deter abuses of the system. While this may be valid concern sometimes, the impact of these measures is often completely disproportionate to the aim to, that they seek to achieve. Moreover, strict conditions are imposed in the absence of enabling conditions such as the provision of childcare facilities or without consideration of a structural barriers in the labor market characterized by high unemployment which make compliance with some of these policies like activation measures impossible to comply with. By imposing excessive requirements and conditions on access to services and benefits and severe sanction in case of non-compliance, the state not only punish, humiliate and undermine the autonomy of persons living in poverty, but they exacerbate the challenges they face in overcoming their situation. Support for these measures is not based on a strong evidence of their effectiveness or economic efficiency, but rather on these discriminatory stigma and stereotypes perpetuated by the media. Requirements and conditions are often underpinned by a strong paternalistic attitude. Policymakers believe they are acting in the best interest of persons living in poverty who cannot be trusted to make decisions for themselves and their families. Unfortunately, oftentimes, these policymakers do not understand the obstacles that people living in poverty face to overcome their situation. As a consequence of the stigma that they suffer, persons living in poverty often develop fear and even hostility towards public authorities and have little confidence in the institution that they should assist them. Due to this prejudice, persons living in poverty are often discouraged from approaching public officials and seeking the support they need. Moreover, stigmatization generates a sense of shame, and shame reduces person agency and increases the exclusion. Not wishing to expose themselves to be further stigmatized by society, Persons living in poverty often refrain from accessing social services or claiming entitlement, such as subsidies or access to public housing or attending free health clinics. 
This further segregates and excludes them, strengthening the vicious silk cycle that perpetuates poverty through generations. To conclude, it is clear that measures that stigmatize and deny the dignity of persons living in poverty are seriously undermining poverty alleviation efforts and only contributing to further inequality and exclusion. Combating this, this negative prejudice against the poor required broad and multifaceted action. On the one hand, the elite political and educated classes, but in general, all of us who are better off in society, must be able to understand and recognize the obstacles that people living in poverty face. This, I am afraid, will require broad education and public awareness campaign. On the other hand, we must also ensure that policies aiming to fight poverty are not based on negative stereotype and prejudice, but on a strong, disaggregated data and evidence of what actually work. On practical level, I believe that a way to achieve this is by the adoption of a human rights-based approach to policy making systematically across all areas. One of the major contributions of a human rights approach to the fight against poverty is the recognition of persons living in poverty as right holders and agents of change. A human rights approach implies a paradigm shift by which the fight against poverty is not considered as an issue of charity or philanthropy or a technocratic exercise to be imposed on those living in poverty. Through a human rights lens, the fight against poverty goes hand in hand with the respect of every person's dignity, autonomy, agency, and the freedom to make one o one's own choices. It also requires to put in place participatory channels to allow people living in poverty to express their view and to actively and meaningfully participate in decision-making policies or processes that affect their lives. Accountability is also at the core of a human rights-based approach. Public officials, policymakers, and other impositions of power must be held accountable for their behaviors and decisions toward people living in poverty. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that if we really want to fight poverty, we have to tackle and dismantle the prejudice and stigma of poverty and combat the systemic exclusion of voices of people living in poverty. This will require fostering empathy, knowledge and awareness through education initiatives, media campaign, training of public officials, large-scale participatory programs and more besides. This is a small price to pay for more inclusive, equal societies where all human beings are valued and granted dignity. It is my contention that, that a human rights approach is an indispensable tool for states and other stakeholders in this regard, not only as a moral duty, but as a legal obligation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Magdalena. Thank you very much to everyone uh, on this side of the table. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all the people uh, on the other side of the table for the attention in following uh, the discussion. We now have uh, a very short break, a coffee break of 15 minutes, and then we start again with uh, Alessandra Schurba, who will explain us uh, the main contents of the guide. Thank you very much.